Today we're going to work more on the educational side, like how this educational um, trajectory actually happens. But let me say a little bit more about the image of God just really quickly. Um, to put what I said yesterday into a broader context, uh, all of the world is seen in Genesis 1 as a temple. And in the ancient Near East, temples were places of worship. That's where you would go to worship a deity. And there would be an image of the deity in the temple. But what God does in Genesis 1 is he reconfigures that whole thing. It's not that you go to one little temple to worship a god and look at like a little wooden or stone object. But all of God's cosmos, the whole universe is a place of God's worship. And God puts humanity in this place to be worship leaders in that sense. Everywhere we go, we should be proclaiming, God reigns here, and look at what God is like. So that as we spread out over the earth, we're all proclaiming the worship of God and also the character of God in the way that we live. So I'm trying to give you a vision for, for that, picturing the image of God like that, understanding your own life in that way. And what I suggested is, is that education can contribute to that in four ways, by helping us know God, because if you don't know God, it's going to be really hard to project a picture of God into the world that's accurate, right? You have to know who God is in order to inhabit his character. And he's also the only way by which we get that character is by the work of God in our lives. Secondly, we have to know the world really well because we have to know what it would look like to inhabit that character in the many different contexts we find ourselves. So in education, in business, in um, science, and in literature, and so on, in the study of those things, we're attending to creaturely realities that are aspects of creation that deserve our attention because God has made them and they're worthy of that attention. We'll talk more about that as we proceed. Third, I mentioned that we need to cultivate a kind of creativity, and I used jazz as an example, of the way that um, improvisation is needed for our own personal expression of the image of God to take shape in the world. And then fourth, we need to develop Christian virtue because God is good. And to understand what goodness is, we need to take on the characteristics of that. Um, in order to then creatively express those in the context we find ourselves. So that's kind of a recap of what we were doing yesterday. Um, so what I want to do today is give you a little bit of a vision for what I think education is in a broader scope even than those four things. Like how does this actually look in a Christian college? Well, I believe that a Christian college education is rigorous education of the whole student. Now, it doesn't start here. You already come into college, or if you're a professor as a, uh, you know, as a faculty member, into this context. As someone who's educated, you've already been taught about life. And yet, college education addresses all the different aspects of life as well. It addresses your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The student's knowledge, loves, and actions are all central to who you are to your character and your personal identity. And then that, in turn, informs your vocation, but also your avocation, or the other things that you do in life. So um, education, ultimately, because it's a kind of formation, facilitates all kinds of different life contexts, things as diverse as family life, work, church life, and even your hobbies ought to be informed by what you learn in this context. So, a student's education and formation takes place ultimately in the context of a mentoring community where everyone is participating as a faithful learner in that community. So ideally, here's the goal, faculty members, 
have journeyed down the paths of their various disciplines and found them to be fruitful for personal formation. And that's why then they're going back to now guide others down those same paths. But it's not that they've sort of done all the learning and now they're just doing the communicating. They're actually still on that journey themselves. And so they're active learners and so faculty and students are together a part of one dynamic learning community that is, they're just people at different stages in that journey and the ones who are further down the road are helping those who are coming behind. In other words, education is a kind of apprenticeship. What that means then is that you have to be apprenticed in lots of different things um, through the curriculum. It has to be challenging, stimulating, transformative. Assignments need to offer um, the ability to develop certain kinds of uh, intellectual virtues, including the apt use of critical thinking skills, the ability to make persuasive arguments based on the evidence, and the ability to synthesize all the things you're learning into a coherent whole. But the community also has to inhabit Christian virtues such as charity. That should be developed in the learning community so that alternative perspectives um, and challenging perspectives are welcomed, respected, engaged, and learned from, even if ultimately the community says that going that direction would be unhelpful. We need to be willing to welcome and engage and respect alternative perspectives and to learn from those. You should be learning from outside of the classroom. I was just talking to a student after chapel yesterday who's in an interesting internship in the Tampa Bay area that he just started last week. Um, but things like internships, service activities, uh, possibly studying abroad at some point, these kind of things um, and, and then especially being involved in a local church context. All of that serves to fill out what you're doing here at a Christian college. So holistic Christian education, the education of heart, soul, mind, and strength best occurs then in a stimulating and honest community of faithful learners. Commitment to Jesus Christ, to rigorous study, and to active service cooperate then in a Christian liberal arts uh, college to help shape the whole student. All right, so that's what I'm re referring to. That kind of apprenticeship and mentoring and holistic formation is what I'm referring to here as vital for helping us live out our human identity as the image of God. Um, what I want to do today is to Re uh, reflect a little bit on the way that theology relates to other disciplines and to look at Genesis 2 and 3 to help us understand um, where things went wrong with Adam and Eve but also then why that helps us understand what the goals of our own education ought to be. Alright, so turning now to the question of theology and how it relates to the other things you're studying. Theology provides the foundation for your other studies. Um, what that means is the way all of our education is justified ultimately comes from the way God has made the world to work. And so we're participating in the way that God has designed the world by seeking knowledge in all of these different areas from literature to science, from education to business. They take up their places in your education um, when they're understood theologically. Knowing and loving God and understanding God's relation to the world are the means by which we know what is best in the world. And theology then creates the foundation for then knowing what virtue looks like in these various fields. But it works the other way around as well. All your other studies go back to inform theology. So here's just one um, simple example of how, of how that looks. Um, at an earlier period in uh, human history, when we didn't have necessarily the same kind of knowledge we do now of like trends in weather, um, and even sometimes people do this now, although it's a lot more rare, um, it was thought that when a natural disaster would strike a certain area that that was 
the specific judgment of God. So like if a hurricane hit, maybe it's because the people in Florida have been particularly sinful. But now the thing is, is that we've done quite a lot of study of the world, right? And we know the world a lot better. And I can tell you that a hurricane is going to hit Florida. Um, right? Again, probably. Or at least I'm, I'm making a suggestion. I don't, I'm not telling you when. I'm not a prophet like that. But I'm just telling you it's likely. That's why like all the homes around here have to have hurricane insurance. The thing is, is that we've studied the patterns of weather enough to be able to recognize th what is likely and unlikely about this. So there's even a hurricane season right? And, and what I meant by hit a hurricane, there will be of course hurricanes that hit, but like a devastating one. Probably a bad one will hit eventually. Um, and we think that about uh, earthquakes in Southern California and uh, tornadoes through Kansas and Ohio and all of these kind of things. So now what we've learned about the world has actually informed then what we think is going on theologically. We don't think that God's necessarily singling out Florida as a place he especially is throwing hurricanes at. But what it does show us is that the world is a broken place and that um, God's judgment will in fact fall. In fact, we see this in uh, Luke 13 when Jesus is talking about the people uh, upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell. And he says some people died there, but don't think that God singled them out for judgment in particular, but recognize that everyone who stands against God will eventually be judged, and this is a signal of that kind of judgment because the world's a broken place and there's suffering here. And so it teaches us something, but what we have learned about the world has helped inform our theological perspective of God's providence and things like that. So not only do, does theology give a foundation to other disciplines, our knowledge of the world goes back and reinforms our theology. Okay, so what I'd like to do though is um, focus in specifically on this whole idea of theological education, how it's necessary and where it went wrong in Genesis 2 and 3, but then relate it back to what I'm saying there, how theology and other disciplines work together. Okay, so let's look at um, Genesis 2 and 3, and I just have a few slides here where I'm highlighting a couple of aspects of the text. Genesis 2, here uh, is the command that God gives to Adam and Eve, and he says, uh, the Lord, or the text says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. All right, now we're all very familiar with that. John Walton, in his commentary on Genesis, points out that um, we need to be able to understand the logic of two things in this text. First of all, what Adam and Eve gain must be viewed as something they do not possess, but naturally desire. So it's something they want but they don't have it already. And then second, um, what they gain must be, must have some reason for being forbidden. Like God forbid that they eat from the tree for a reason. And it's important to note that after the creation week, God says, this is very good, right? Everything in there is really good. So we can't sort of pin the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as itself being something evil. God only makes things that are good. So it's not that like the tree was intrinsically evil and it was somehow going to bring harm like that. It has to be that they wanted something good, but they looked in the wrong place to find it. So what we have in Genesis 3 gives us some further insight here. The serpent says to the woman, in verses 4 and 5, You will not surely die. He had already asked, you know, what did God say about this? And he says, You will not die if you eat from the tree, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now what's important to note here is, and, and a lot of times we've made a mistake here in um, theology, and that is, that we take that line, you'll be like God, as being the bad part, right? That they, they were full of pride. They were like, oh, 
I could be my own God. I don't really think that's what's going on. Remember in Genesis 1, we were told they're supposed to be like God. They're made in God's image. So they're supposed to be like God, and the serpent knows that, and he's actually tempting them. God knows that if you eat from this, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. Doesn't that sound good? And what we have is um, God's recognition of this, even um, after the woman eats from the tree. So what happens is, the woman saw that the tree was good for, God, uh, good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. That's, that's the key line, I think, right there. That the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. But notice God's conclusion at the end of chapter 3. We often don't tie this together, too, when we only look at the, the sort of Sunday school version of this story. We sometimes leave out God's, God's evaluation. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. That's a shocking statement. Like God is saying, Yep, the serpent was in some ways telling the truth. If you eat from the tree, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And God says, oh, they ate from the tree and now they're like us, knowing good and evil. We can't let them eat from the tree of life, so let's kick them out of the garden. So this is a real surprise because all of a sudden you think the serpent is just a liar, but actually God is saying that the serpent was right about this one thing, and that is that looking to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for wisdom did give them a new perspective on the world where they sought wisdom from the creature rather than the creator. Paul puts it like this in Romans 1. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now, that, that's just a, a wonderful evaluation of what happens here because Adam and Eve are looking at the tree and thinking that the tree can give them true wisdom. But what Paul's saying as he looks back at that story, it seems to, I, I think that's what's going on in Romans 1. Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So the whole pattern of idolatry gets Find its, finds its root in what Adam and Eve do. They sought wisdom, but not wisdom from God. They sought wisdom from creation itself. They thought that they could like, look into the world and think that that would then tell them what life was all about, and they could somehow achieve and realize their identity in a healthy way. But ultimately, what's, what I think Genesis 1 through 3 is teaching us is not only are we made in the image of God, but we have to look to God in order to know what that looks like. We cannot do without theology, in other words. We have to be constantly looking at who God is in order to be formed according to that pattern. Otherwise, we will inevitably look to creation to tell us what life is about, and our life will become disordered, and then that's the whole list in Romans 1 of the various ways that the world has become disordered because of idolatry. So, um, this whole question of Genesis 2 and 3, uh, I think sets up a very intriguing picture of how theology ought to fit into our overall education, again, as this foundational piece. That instead of um, looking to the world to tell us about the right ways of living. I don't mean the world there in like just the sinful world. I just mean the world in general, like looking at creation itself. That we need to look to God for guidance. And this kind of pattern is set up in the book of Proverbs and a number of other places where we look to who God is and what his instruction is like because he knows this place. He knows what the world is all about. And therefore that gives us the foundation for then pursuing all kinds of other knowledge. So Proverbs is full of worldly wisdom but it's full of wisdom about the world that comes from a divine perspective. So how do we get that divine perspective? That's the question that we're gonna to try to tackle here. And why do we think that theology can give it to us? A lot of people have raised 
um, that question as well. Like, why do we think that doing theology, isn't that just kind of some ivory tower stuff? You know, like you're just contemplating all this crazy stuff about God, but the real life gets lived down on the ground. Well, what I'm going to try to suggest here is that, um, no, the real life gets lived because of what we gain from a true and living contemplation of God. But to do that, I need to, to sort of set that up by giving you the principles for why I think that's the case. So, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about God's own knowledge of himself. God can be known by us, first and foremost, because God knows himself. So 1 Corinthians 2 says, For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Any knowledge of God that is had by us is derivative. It's something given and shared with us, but it starts with God's own knowledge of himself. And this is an in, intra-Trinitarian claim. The Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, and the Spirit knows the Father, and the Son, and the Father and the Son know the Spirit. That in the divine life, God is known, and therefore, He wants us to know Him. He's inviting us into a knowledge that He already enjoys. So, Matthew eleven twenty-seven: 27. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. So what fruit does that bear? God knows himself. Okay, that's an important piece of theology. I think it's actually a crucial one. But what um, does that uh, like produce in God's own life? Because I think uh, understanding that's going to help us understand what it ought to produce in our lives. If we understand that God's knowledge, uh, what, what that produces in God's life, then we can understand ourselves better. So Jesus' prayer in John 17 is instructive. You've given your son, he says, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life. Notice this, I mean, this is just, again, a huge observation uh, and insight from Jesus. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That they may know you, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Now, knowledge we have to recognize is not just knowledge about. Um, so I mentioned this yesterday in terms of marriage. It's not like I just um, want to know about my wife, um, but I want to actually know my wife, right, Christy? So I just don't want like the facts from afar. I want to have a real personal relationship with her. And that's what this is talking about here. So it's not merely knowing about God and about Jesus, but actually knowing God and knowing Jesus. And then Jesus says this, I've glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now, notice here that what the work is in that context is actually making the Father known. That it's when God is known that he's glorified. So the knowledge of God in God's own life actually produces glory in God's own life. So Jesus is saying that he glorified the Father and he's saying that the Father glorifies him because he becomes known among those people who receive the gospel. And all of that is done by the power of the Spirit. So... Um, one of the things that the knowledge of God produces in God's own life is glory. Now here's another aspect of that. God's self-knowledge also makes God wise. Or better, God's self-knowledge is his wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of God. And this is the, the argument in 1 Corinthians 1 where Paul says that Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because you're in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So, the incarnation reveals to us what was already the case. We, it, he's made known to us as the wisdom of God, but he already, for all eternity, is the wisdom of God. So what we learn about God is that his knowledge, his own self-knowledge, produces glory and it produces wisdom. Wisdom. 
Now let's turn to the way that we are invited into that knowledge. What does it look like for us to receive the knowledge of God? Well, we have to say right out of the gates that we can't make God reveal himself. To go back to uh, the parental metaphor here for a second, um, this would be terribly sinful and tragic, but I could just, you know, uh, my son, who's almost two, um, I could abandon my family, right? That would be, like I said, terrible. But I could do that, and then he would never know me. In other words, I can hide myself from them. So the fact that I make myself known to my family is a matter of my will. They can't control me because they're not old enough to do that. It has to be something given. And the same is true with God, only on a much larger scale. We can't know God just by sort of thinking about him because we would never know what to think about that would then project the right kind of God. What we need is for God to make himself known. So this is all on God's side. It's all on his will. It's something we're completely dependent on him to receive. So God condescends to make himself known to us. Um, and this is shown to us also looking back at a passage that we just looked at a moment ago, and that's Matthew 11:27. We find that the Son's knowledge of the Father is revealed to God's people. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, Jesus says. But then there's this great aspect of this. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So only the Father knows the Son and the Son knows the Father, but we get the chance to receive that because Jesus has chosen to reveal the Father to us. So in John 1.18 it says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side has made him known. And again, um, then in John 17, Righteous Father, though the world doesn't know you, I know you, and they know that you've sent me. I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in, in them and I myself may be in them. Now, so on the one hand, God makes himself known. On the other hand, God sanctifies our intellect so that we can, in fact, then receive that revelation. It says um, in 1 Corinthians 2, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. So this is again very Trinitarian. The Father is made known through the Son because Jesus reveals God to us and by the power of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit in our lives that allows us to receive the knowledge of God. Now what does that produce? If in God's life the knowledge of God produces glory, and wisdom, what does it produce for us? Well, um, keep go, you know, referring back to these same texts. In John 17, um, it says, All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. The people of God glorify Jesus because we know the Father, through the Son and believe that the Son is from the Father. It's this knowledge then that leads us to worship. So the parallel thing here where for God in his own life where he knows himself this leads to glory. For us that leads us to worship. So if we want to worship well we have to know who God is and actually be in personal relationship with him. So human worship, embracing God's name and so giving God glory, is a creaturely act patterned upon God's own life. And that's what we do, you know, like before chapel here as we have the last three days, and that is to give God praise and to worship him, but not just in song, but in all of our lives. Our lives are lives of worship. The other thing it produces in us is that the spirit of wisdom turns God's wisdom towards us and instructs us in that. So for the human creature, knowing God leads to wisdom. In fact, Proverbs 3 pictures wisdom as the tree of life. So going back to Genesis 3, at where um, God protects us from the tree of life, here wisdom is pictured as that tree of life. And it says that those who hold her fast are called blessed. Blessed. 
Dan Trier says this in his commentary on Proverbs. Rather than being told by God what was good and evil, Eve would decide as much for herself, or so the serpent falsely advertised. But rather, now in the Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, for the fear of the Lord is the principle of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So what the knowledge of God produces in God's life is glory and wisdom, and what it produces then in our lives is worship and wisdom, a creaturely kind of wisdom that then helps us live correctly in the world. All right, so what that means is that theology, this is why it's foundational for all of our other pursuits, because we don't just want to know about the world, we want to be wise in engaging it. So that means theology is the way of forming that wisdom that then allows us to pursue these other disciplines in the right kind of virtue. Um, but now I want to describe why it's still absolutely vital to pursue all of those things. In other words, you can't only have theology, you need theology and all of these other studies. Um, why? Well, being a college student or someone who works at a college like myself, um, gives us the special opportunity to care about God and God's creatures and to pay careful attention to them and their activities, to show loving intimacy um, toward God and what God has made. You don't only study things that will make, you know, uh, you better at your job later on. In other words, it's not just for practicality. You study things because they're worth studying because God cared enough about those things to make them and therefore made them worthy of your attention. If, on the other hand, we study just to learn what we need for a job, as important as future jobs are, because you do eventually have to pay the bills and your parents would be very unhappy if you didn't, um, then you're not understanding what God has made in the right kind of context, this idea that it's worth our attention to do it. Merely learning for your own future control of your knowledge is to miss the fact that we're meant to know and to wonder and to delight at God's creation for his sake and also for the sake of others. So um, what does this look like? Let's say, um, as I'm uh, walking about, in fact, this kind of just happened w with my family. We went over to Honeymoon Island the other day, and there was this great little uh, pool of water that had been cut off, I guess, from uh, the rest of the bay there, and um, and the ocean, I guess, on the two sides. Or I don't even know how it's organized. Maybe that's not the. Never mind. My my, my geography here is is still a little questionable. Okay, so the, the gulf, I should say. So it's cut off from the gulf, but, and there were tons of little minnows in there, and fish were doing, you know, and there was a bird, a beautiful bird, but just standing there, you know, having a feast. Um, but when I look at that whole scene, and I delight in it, what does it do? I take delight in something that God has made, and it should lead me, if I understand the world well, to worship. So knowledge of God leads me to worship, but also as I delight in the world. This should lead me back to worship. But then if I'm trying to care for the bird well, if I'm trying to understand the world in a way where I'm making the world flourish like God makes it flourish, as I said we should from Genesis 1, the idea that we're made in God's image is to rule the world, but to rule it with the character God has, not to rule it for our own gain, but for the benefit of the world um, itself because God is acting towards the world for its benefit. Then it also demands that I take the bird's life very seriously and try to again gain a kind of wisdom about that aspect of creation in order to care well for that part of the world. Um, this has tons of implications for questions of animal ethics. I just saw something uh, yesterday about the way that they're genetically modifying a bunch of animals in a science facility in Nebraska. And the questions that that raises for us as Christians about whether modifying those animals just so that we can produce more meat and less fat and that they can have more babies um, than they were sort of 
designed by God to have and so on. Um, whether those are good things, that's a whole area of research that's demanded here um, if we're going to care for the world well. And I'm not an expert in those areas, but we need people who are to be doing those things. Now let's think about business for a second. Studying business is studying humanity. Humans have needs, interests, goals, enjoyments that businesses seek to meet, supplying, satisfying products and services in response. Doing business well as a Christian is a very complex matter though because Christian businesses can't just produce anything that will make them money. Some businesses do that, right? But we can't do that as Christians. So let's take an obvious example. Christian businesses can't make and sell pornography, even though you might be able to make a lot of income from it. Why? Because pornography is destructive to the people involved in making it and in the people who consume it. So it's a destructive thing. It wouldn't be Christian to participate in that. And we shouldn't benefit from it financially either. So there's an obvious example, but here's where it gets a lot more difficult. What about other areas of American consumption? Can Christians benefit from selling products and services aimed merely at entertainment if buying those products and services are going to put someone into crippling debt? In other words, someone comes into your store and you're selling televisions and you, there's a 60 inch television there that's gonna be great for the Super Bowl and the person wants it for their Super Bowl party, but to get it, they're gonna have to like whip out um, their credit card and they're gonna be paying it off for far too long and that's gonna hinder their flourishing as a human being. Do we have, Christ as Christians, do we have obligations to actually provide services and products that we believe will truly help people flourish according to the way that God sees the world, not merely in ways that are going to produce um, the greatest gains or the biggest bottom line, but actually produce things that are going to help people arrive at themselves, having the right kind of character and imaging God in the right kinds of ways. That makes things much, much more difficult. Now again, I'm not trying to answer that question for you whether you should sell the television. You're going to have to talk to your business professors about that. But what um, I'm trying to point out is that these are deeply integrated fields and theology has to inform how we even, th and, and the idea that people are made in the image of God, has to inform how we would even think about what we might develop and sell and so on. So a business in this case needs to delight in learning about humans and offer work to God in worship. Um, and that demands that the work itself be worshipful work, that it actually help people along this path to knowing and loving God. Okay, so as a final conclusion then to this, uh, let me just say a couple of things about integration. Our learning and teaching needs to be integrated that means. So this formation that I'm talking about, whole student formation, has to come from integrated study and integrated learning where um, we're not studying Bible over here and theology over there or, and then um, like business over here and literature over here and science and exercise science and these kind of things in different places but actually that these are cooperative endeavors. It means that we need to give serious attention to scripture, to Christian tradition, and to contemporary Christian practice, and relate that to the ever-growing body of knowledge gained in those disciplines themselves. It also means that we have to trust that our Christian faith has the resources to um, meet these questions and take them up constructively and compellingly. So resourcing Christian doctrine for reflection on politics, economics, gender, sexuality, environmental studies, and etc. These um, are vital for the holistic formation of a college.
Um, and so in this case, again, I want to return to that idea of apprenticeship, that you as students um, should think of yourselves as being apprenticed by your professors. And professors, you have to look at yourself as um, those apprenticing your students, that you're bringing them into not just a kind of knowledge, you're not delivering something you have over, but actually you're teaching them how to pursue that knowledge for themselves what virtues they need in order to navigate this field of life, not just now, but 10 years from now, when they're actually practicing, um, who knows how, you know, with, with the way people have like five different careers in their life now, the many different things that everyone's gonna have to do over the course of their lifetime. How have they inhabited the virtues of the di these different disciplines? And the virtues um, that are given to us uh, as expressions of the image of God remade in Christ so that as all those contexts change, all those professions and careers change, um, we're actually faithful to God and creative enough to meet those different challenges in new and fresh ways that both show forth who God is and also provide um, a flourishing in the world for yourselves and also the people who you're engaged with um, in whatever jobs you actually take up. So I think hopefully that this gives us some things to, um, to work on and tonight we're gonna talk more about uh, the virtues specifically that need to be developed here. Um, but uh, I hope that this has contributed to your own understanding of what you're doing as a student or what you're doing as a faculty and staff member. Let me pray for you and then I'll let you go. Father, we are um, grateful that you've invited us to know you. You've um, made yourself known and are in fact caring for us and leading us in your way and I pray that we will follow those ways and draw closer and ever closer to um, knowing you and loving you. And we pray that you'll walk with us and, and uh, as you promised, know us and love us and bless us in Christ. And I pray that this would be the kind of thing that transforms life and education and uh, professional pursuits and family life and um, the whole range of dynamics uh, that we all face on a day-to-day -day basis. I pray you'll work powerfully by your spirit to bring that about in us and through us as we seek to represent you faithfully and make you known in the world. So we give you praise and thanks today in Jesus' name. Amen.